Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Hey everyone, welcome to a brand new series on every version ever. My name is Jonathan North, and today we're kicking off a new series of reviews focusing on a brand new book, H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds. This is the first series in which I am starting out completely fresh, doing a story I've never covered before, but it's one I've wanted to cover for ages. I've actually had this idea kicking around in my head of doing a review series on The War of the Worlds for at least two years, long before this podcast was even an idea, so I'm so excited to finally get things started. So, to start out the series, I thought it was important that we start out with the original adaptation, Orson Welles' 1938 radio play that has since become rather infamous due to the apparently terrified reaction that his broadcast seems to have caused in America. Historians like to debate on how much of that hysteria was manufactured by the press, but regardless of the level of terror, a not insignificant amount of people thought that this broadcast was real, at least for a little bit, and probably for like a half an hour or so assumed that it was the end of the world. Of course, like I said, the numbers of people who thought this was real may have been exaggerated by the press, but since this particular adaptation does occupy such an interesting space in American history, I thought it was important to talk about it, despite the fact that this isn't actually a film adaptation. And like I said in the preview for this series, even though I'm mainly going to be focusing on film adaptations of literature, sometimes I'll switch things up. Gotta keep things interesting. Now to cover the events surrounding this 1938 broadcast, I thought it was important to enlist the help of my cousin Sarah. Now, if you know Sarah at all, you'll know that The War of the Worlds is definitely not her cup of tea. In fact, I don't think she's ever read the book before, and I'm not sure she was even able to fully listen to the entire broadcast before we recorded. I think she got to the part where people were being incinerated with the heat ray, and decided that was enough for the night, and then never went back. <laughs> However, Sarah is such a big history buff, especially the World War II era, that I knew she'd be familiar with this broadcast and the history surrounding it. And when I asked her, yeah, she was totally interested in talking about it. She's just not a big fan of the story, which, in this case, I figured was probably fine. So in order to prepare for this episode, we each did our own research, and I of course re-listened to the play. I actually own a version on CD that I bought years ago, so I was already familiar with it. But of course I wanted to listen to it again before we talked about it. And then I came across a documentary from PBS from their American Experience series, all about this event in history, and it was available on Amazon Prime, so we watched that before we recorded too. And I just wanted to mention that because if you're interested in learning more about these events and hearing from people who are actually there, that documentary was really fascinating. Anyway, I think that's enough of an intro. Let's get into this episode of Every Version Ever, kicking off our series on H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds. Well, I guess we could start by talking about, well, this is probably only going to be relevant for me, but personal history with the story. Go for it. <laughs> well, when I was a kid, I had this huge set of abridged books, like classic novels that were abridged for kids, and War of the Worlds was one of them. What all did they take out of that to make it more palatable to children? Um, well, <laughs> in reading it again, I did not remember anything about the Martians using humans as food. Because in the book, they didn't eat people, but they like took them for like a blood transfusion and the person died. I don't oh. remember that happening at all in the abridged version. Right. <laughs> so I think they took that out. But with that abridged version, it is stuck in my head so clearly because I never read it when I was really young. I was terrified of the book because the front was these hideous creatures attacking a city. And I had mom take it away and hide it from me. <laughs> okay, so you were spared at least for a little while. That and... Uh, what the... do we become as adults? No, I want to read that. I want to read the whole book. That book and Sherlock Holmes' Hound of the Baskervilles. I had her hide them both from me. Right. Because there were illustrations in The Hound of the Baskervilles that were horrifying to me as a child. I think... But I remembered those books. And like several years later, I was like, maybe I'm old enough. Can I have them back now? <laughs> and then I read them and I loved them. <laughs> okay. We are all individuals. <laughs> yeah, as tying in with that... 
this really is your story because mm -hmm. I had family members who went to see one of the adaptations in the theater. I stayed home. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, I self identify as a highly sensitive person and you need to be careful what you stick in your brain when you're very sensitive and when you have a very, very strong imagination. Because even as an adult, I have a very, very vivid imagination. So things that would be like, meh, so somebody just died in agony on the screen. I'll be like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if, if a crime was committed thousands of years ago and I just read about it, I might feel genuinely horrified and terrible for the people who have mm. been dead for a very long time. So a story like this, I need to be careful. And I started listening to the 1938 radio broadcast and it was late at night and I got partway through and there was screaming and I'm like, just stop. So <laughs> you need to not do this to yourself. But here's the catch. Even with my, I have, I have a love hate relationship with dark stuff because I'm very interested in some very dark topics like World War II and very interested in pretty much any aspect of history of the first half of the 20th century. The 1930s is one of my top periods of interest and this was recorded in 1938 and it ties into so many historically interesting things that I'm like, okay, I don't know if I really want to listen to the rest of this play, but I do want to talk about the history with you. And so here we are. So if I seem ignorant about the story, but I'm going off on weird rabbit trails, you're welcome. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're, you're going to get a unique podcast, I hope, out mm -hmm. of it that will be very informative. And if you like the story, it might make you like it even more which I don't know if that's a good thing, but <laughs> but it is it both the story itself and the context of this radio play. It's very mm -hmm. historically interesting. Yeah, that's the reason that I wanted to do this one with you because I did actually have somebody else who was interested in doing the radio play with me, but I was like, I feel like this is the perfect thing to talk about with Sarah because this is like right in Sarah's wheelhouse. Even though she doesn't like the story, I just knew that you would have an interesting perspective on the history. And if you ever want to do, like, a spinoff with that person, I don't know what all they wanted to talk about. But, no, I I have thoughts. <laughs> I have thoughts. Well, I haven't decided what the best way to talk about this is, so we could just maybe start at the beginning and maybe, like, do a quick overview of how the play went. Because... Uh, there are things in the play that maybe have informed the history <laughs> surrounding it. So I don't know if it would be like start at the beginning of the play and then jump into a historical topic that's relevant to that. I think, ooh, because there, oh, there are different, there are different directions. I think one of the biggest takeaways from this play that that we want to hammer home is that it caused panic. And the reasons surrounding that panic. Mm -hmm. And one of the important things to note was when they decided to do this play, it was really rushed. And when Orson Welles initially saw it, he thought it was going to be so boring. And then they decided to do it as a news broadcast format. And mm -hmm. they made it extra juicy. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, just, how, I'll let you start it off, and then I'll try and just start interjecting stuff. Well, it, just in case there's anybody out there who has no idea what the War of the World is, it's yes. basically, the original story is set in the late 1800s, and it's basically Martians invading the English countryside. And this play took that basic story and some of the events in that, and turned it into an American version 
with Martians invading New Jersey in 1938, and then having sort of a play-by-play -play as if it were a news broadcast documenting in real time what was happening in New Jersey. And they used real place names. The mm -hmm. guy went out close to, you know, he was basically panicking trying to get this thing ready. He pulled the name of Grover's Mill out of a hat, basically. I think he just looked at a map and then kind of just pointed into a I don't know, it was parked next to, a, next to a field or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it helped to lend another layer of realism, and it was one of the things that helped to spark panic. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, there's more than one thing that has to be brought up with this. One of them may be good to mention before we get into the night of the plane, the night of the play, is Mars in the psyche of America at this time. Because back then, in the early 1900s, there was an Italian who looked at Mars and he saw channels. And the Italian for that was Canali, but when it was interpreted to Americans, they used the word canals. And in the American mind, canals were man-made. Mm -hmm. And so it was easier for them to picture beings living on Mars making these canals. And that was part of what helped to generate this idea, this wondering in the American mind of life on Mars. I Along feel like I've read some other early science fiction that had life on Mars, and I feel like canals played a part in those stories. But there was less knowledge of space, and this was just, it was seemed more plausible, and frankly, there are a lot of things that we don't know, but as far as the little green men from Mars or mm -hmm. whatever, this was one of the things that helped to say, helped to lay the foundation mm -hmm. for the panic of the 1938 broadcast. Okay, so this broadcast starts on the eve of Halloween, mm -hmm. when people might already be kind of on edge. Yes, because... On my other podcast, we t we had like a long discussion about Halloween in our Meet Me in St. Louis episode, if you want to go reference that. But Halloween used to be different than it is now. There was a lot of mischief making. One of the newspaper articles that talked about, I believe, the panic of the War of the World broadcast also shows an article headline talking about people trying to have a safer Halloween. Mm -hmm. It was already a bad time for bad pranks. Mm -hmm. Kids that were way out of control. Just not a good era for Halloween. But it was like this perfect storm mm -hmm. because radio was fairly new. News flashes on the radio were a new thing and they were very gripping to people. They had just... I don't think you could even say that they were fully over the Great Depression. There was Bad news, bad news all the time. And Hitler was on the move. About a month earlier, they had just had the Munich crisis, which oh, is a byword for like the futility of those type of agreements because Hitler said that he was done after that. He wasn't going to take any more territory. They were just trying to appease... Hitler by giving him the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia and he had put out all these lies about the Czech people and just created this whole storm of events and got his way but the American people had just gotten done hearing about all of that and it was basically around a year later that World War II officially started but you had the threat of the Germans, you had the oppression of the Great Depression, and you had the wondering in the American mind of, are aliens real? And you had the overwhelming appeal of radio to Americans who, even though they might have been getting rid of other things, they were still buying radios, and they still really wanted that connection 
to the world and that form of entertainment. Mm -hmm. So you come to this night <laughs> with this radio program that they said was just a play at mm -hmm. the beginning, but not everybody was there for the beginning of the program. <laughs> It was a Sunday evening, and I have a whole rabbit trail about this. That's fine. Mercury Theater <laughs> was not the most well-known program running at the time. They didn't even have a sponsor. They got one after the panic, oddly enough. <laughs> at the time, the really popular program was the Chase and Sanborn Hour. With Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. A puppet. Yes. Okay. Normally, they started out this program with the banter between Edgar Bergen and his puppet. Mm -hmm. Which I'm sure was amusing for a lot of people at the time. I would have to listen to it to know whether it's cringy 1930s humor or actually <laughs> funny 1930s humor. I don't know. But instead, they had Nelson Eddy singing. And people started tuning away, you know, going, turning the dial, seeing what else was on. Basically the 1930s equivalent of channel surfing. Yes. And they, this was about two minutes and 17 seconds into the broadcast, and they got in on War of the Worlds when it was already roaring right along and horrifying. Okay, I don't know how much anybody really focuses in on what was going on on the Chase and Sanborn hour. <laughs> and I think it's interesting. Um, because I'm a Nelson Eddy fan. <laughs> <laughs> and he was an operatic baritone, which... For a lot of people, is like, oh, hand me the wastebasket so I can throw up. I don't like that music. But what's interesting to me is, oh, well, you could think, well, why was he on that show? Was he even a good fit for that show? Was he just some random guest and that just, it wasn't in, the people weren't into it? No, he was a regular on the show. He wasn't even listed as a guest because he was on the show that much. And yet people were dialing away. Why? Now, let's talk a little bit about Nelson Eddy. <laughs> <laughs> he was a born singer. He had kind of a, you know, his father left and he had a messed up home life. But he had this wonderful gift. He even got fired from a job because he was singing constantly. He became the most highly paid singer in the world. Hmm. He has three stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. One really? for film, one for recording, one for radio. He was highly appealing both to shrieking Bobby Soxers, I think is how one article put it, <laughs> as well as opera fans. So he appealed to young women as well as classical aficionados. So why were they dialing away? Was it because grandpa was next to the radio and was like, I don't want to listen to that guy. Whereas, you know, Susie's in the kitchen. No, it's Nelson Eddy. I don't know. He had a 40 year career. He was, he was over the top famous. He was one of the most popular singers of the 1930s, if not the most popular singer. I think Bing Crosby might put him out. It just depends on who you read and who you believe, I suppose, or, or maybe what your preference is. So why were they dialing away? Here's my theory. <laughs> <laughs> the first song was called Song of the Vagabonds. <laughs> And it was from a 1920s operetta by Rudolf Frimmel. Yes, he was famous back then. But that doesn't fully explain it either. 
because the movie, which I, the operetta slash movie that this song came from, I believe, was called The Vagabond King. They actually made a movie in 1930, which was pre code, so be careful. Um, <laughs> so this was popular enough to be made into a movie, and it wasn't an old movie. That was only eight years ago. So why were they dialing away? They probably had already heard this song in theaters not that long ago. Here's the thing. The song was set, the movie slash song was set in the 1400s. It was a conflict in France, probably a hypothetical conflict. I have to look it up again. But it was a call to battle. And I'm wondering, A, how relatable was it? It may or may not have been relatable, depending on whether they were into the movie or into the song. But at a time when they had just gotten done with the Munich crisis and they're in the depression, to have this song being called to basically rally to battle, maybe these people hanging out at home were like, no, I don't want to hear a battle song. What else is on? That's what I'm wondering. Hmm. And it was the first song that he sang, and that's probably when people started dialing. Hmm. The second song that he sang was called Canadian Logging Song. And even as a fan of Nelson Eddy, I'm like, I don't know what accent you're doing, and not super into it. Down the rivage we float, we float the logs, they make the ground a boat. On the logs we leap and laugh as safe upon the logs as on the road. So there were probably even more panic stricken people during that number <laughs> we tuned, tuned away to War of the Worlds. But you can see this is just a theory where people who may have been like, Ugh, I don't want to listen to this battle song that Eddie is singing while they're tuning away. If they hear something that sounds like a newsflash, they might be like, oh, great. What's going on in Europe now? Except and, it wasn't Europe. It was New Jersey. And not even that. Mm -hmm. So I could come down on these people for, oh, they didn't, they weren't appreciating a cultural song or something, but... I can see where they would be either just not into that song or whether they didn't feel like hearing the militant content of that song. So it's just an interesting thought that I don't think that you're really going to hear from somebody else because one of the articles that I was on, I'm guessing he wasn't a classical fan. He just, he described Eddie as caterwauling. It's like, no, this dude was hugely popular. And mm -hmm. So I just wanted to bring that idea and that perspective to the table and it's just another piece of the puzzle of why you had this massive panic mm -hmm. and part of what may have been behind it so there you go <laughs> <laughs> yeah he 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 did so much he was in movies nightclubs um opera he was just all over the place so it's not like they just had some random dude on there that people weren't into. And at the time, like, before the three tenors, there were people like Nelson Eddy, Jeanette McDonald, Deanna Durbin, who all had operatic voices and were wildly popular. So, there you go. Back to War of the Worlds. <laughs> well, that was, yeah, it was a rabbit trail, but... It actually had a point. Yeah, and... I, that's not something that I would have thought of, and I don't know that how many other people would think that way. So, this is this is why yeah, I wanted I was, you on the podcast. I, 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 I was I was discussing it with my sister, and 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 she was started she clicked and started saying that before I was even saying that out loud. So I don't know who had the thought first, but it totally makes sense. Rather than this guy, whoever wrote that article, just thinking that the songs were awful and that whoever produced the show had messed up. Like, mm -hmm. yes, they needed to pick different songs. And if they had picked different songs, the night might have had a different outcome. So, but it, I think it was for, probably for a reason that he hadn't thought of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, in the story, 
I'm not sure. It would be interesting to find out where the the two radio programs lined up so you could kind of get an idea exactly where people were picking up. You but, can, because he started singing at 2 minutes and 17 seconds into the program. You didn't really have to be far past the beginning. All you really needed was to miss the part where they're saying, this is just a play, mm -hmm. before you're already caught up in all the weirdness. Mm -hmm. Well, the, one of the things that I found interesting, especially about the beginning here, is that even though this is supposed to be happening in real time, if you're really paying attention, which, which I'm I sure a lot of people <laughs> back then weren't, they were just hooked on the story, things happen so much faster than in the book. Because at the very beginning, they talk about seeing explosions on Mars. And in the book, I think it's like several weeks, if not months, that pass between seeing these explosions on Mars, which were evidently the rockets taking off, Kind of like reading an epic quest versus watching an epic quest played out on a movie. Yes, that was how I was thinking of this as I was listening to it. It was like, this is happening in movie time. <laughs> if you're reading it, it's like, and we were tramping through the wilderness for a week and this weird thing happened. Watching it, all of a sudden, this weird thing happened. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so in between, like probably in the first two minutes, you go from having explosions on Mars and then... The, there's like interludes of music and then interrupting with a new report and then they're going to interview this guy about the explosions on Mars and then he gets this telegram that talks about there's the, something happening in Grover's Mill, there's a farmer had an asteroid hit his field or something and then they actually go there. But like, if you really stop and think about it, this all happened within just a few minutes. So you have supposedly this guy, this reporter going from his station to this observatory do, to do this interview and then them going to this field to see this thing that has landed all within the span of like probably less than five minutes when in reality this would be probably hours worth of things happening which i did not think about when i was listening to i don't think a lot of people did and i never thought about it the first time i listened to this years ago but i was like, paying more attention to this, this time specifically, because I was thinking, like, how would people have thought about this? What would they think listening to this? Would they, how would they have misinterpreted this as something real? And I think it just comes down to the fact that they were really good actors doing this. Like, Orson Welles, I'm pretty sure, was playing the professor. Because when I heard his voice, I was like, I think that's Orson Welles. It seems kind of weird that they're having him play this guy who's not even a main character. But then it kind of turned out that he was the main character. Because after all this stuff goes down in Grover's Mill, and the Martians come out and the reporter is offed. Which was nasty. You meet somebody... I think the radio station is turned over to the military at that point. And then they find the professor bunkered down in this house. And then I realized that this was matching up with something that happened in the story to the narrator. Because in the story, in the book, there's just a narrator telling what happened to him. And you never you never find out his name. He references his wife and brother, but he never names either of them. Mm. The only people that get names are, like, the side characters. And even a lot of them don't get names because he calls one, like, the artillery man and the other a curate. Mm. And you're very few people actually get names. So I was just matching up these events from the radio play with the things that happened in the book. And I realized that this is the point in the book where it has been several weeks of an onslaught of these Martians. I think another thing that could have thrown people is if they tuned in and all of a sudden they were hearing those screams mm, where the yeah. fear reflex could have kicked in and started to drive away logic yeah, too. That's definitely a possibility. Because they were really good screams. Yeah. Yeah, they had they had a whole bunch of people there, like, specific, probably specifically for that, but they had, like, at least ten actors for a play that only had three or four main characters. So you had all these other people doing, like, background talking and, like, incidental voices in the background when things were mm. happening. Mm. And they really added to the realism. Another thing that through people was that there was a character who was not called the president, but he was told mm. to do his best 
Roosevelt impersonation. And so that overrode in people's minds, and they're like, I heard the president, mm -hmm. who was not painting it as a great picture. <laughs> no. And another thing that really threw people off was when people did start to panic and make phone calls to the station and to police, they told him to take a break immediately and basically remind people that it was a play. And he was so into what he was doing that he kept going for another 10 minutes, at which point people were probably off packing their bags and fleeing. Yeah, the interruption that happened was at about 40 minutes. So this radio play is only an hour long. So they probably called at about a half an hour to try and get them to do like a little reminder of what mm -hmm. this play was. And it didn't Which happen a, until 40 minutes. I mean, a half hour is already a long time to not have any kind of reminder. I think part of this comes back to what you said at the beginning. They weren't sponsored. So they had no obligation to pause ah, and do a and commercial. and be like, buy the shaving cream. Yeah. So that probably helped. Wow. He was an artiste. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I have to wonder... How oblivious was he when they told him to take a break? I, probably. Well, I don't think he even realized the scope of what was happening. I don't think he thought that anybody was going to actually fully believe this is real. Like He wanted it to be as realistic as possible, but I don't so think... So, in his brain, he was probably thinking, no, I'm not ready for a break. I want to get to this part. I want to... Probably, because at that point in the story, it does change. Because... Up until this point, you've had news bulletin after news bulletin and army transmissions talking about all these things that are happening. And the last things that you hear are these Martian cylinders are now falling all over the country because, like, the reserves have arrived. Like, there's more Martians coming. Was this the point where people tuning in thought that there was a German invasion? I think that that is probably part of it because and I'm, I'm not sure exactly how accurate this is but in the documentary that we watched there was speculation that people didn't even fully realize that this was about aliens because they would right. hear aliens and think alien can mean a foreigner yes. so you have the two strains of people the people who think that martians are literally invading and the other people who think that we are being invaded by Germany. Mm -hmm. And part of what's going on in the story before this is there's the scene with the black smoke, which a lot of people would probably interpret to mean gas, which is something that had happened in other parts of the world. And even though this is a completely different thing, they're not really thinking rationally at this point. There were people fleeing out of their houses with wet cloths over their mm -hmm. faces. So I don't think a lot of people are even really thinking too much about the content. They're thinking more about there's something's an enemy, happening. There's an enemy threat. Yeah. Of some kind of enemy. And there were people calling in wondering where the safest place to go was from where where to go to get away from the gas, where the safest place was, whether it was on top of the roof or lower down. So there were people who thought that this was it or, you know, that their lives would be over shortly or that they needed to flee or both. Mm -hmm. And part of, I think, what made this panic more notable is that I think some of the people who were really afraid may have tuned out by this point and started fleeing. Because after the point where they remind people that this is a play, the storytelling format completely changes. Because after that, it's no longer news bulletins. Another thing that happened, there was a power outage. Unrelated, oh, yeah. totally unrelated, in Washington State. And people were literally fleeing into the mountains. 
<laughs> just imagine listening to this <laughs> radio, hearing about an alien invasion, and suddenly your lights go out. <laughs> it's they they were having a creepy time in yeah. Washington State, and then you couldn't call anybody. You you had. Not that communication was necessarily that clear or great on the subject at the time anyway, but they couldn't communicate with anybody. Mm. Depending on where they were and how many people were listening to this and how many people were panicking, I could imagine that the phone operators would have been probably overwhelmed at that point. Because mm -hmm. the phones didn't work the same way they do now. They had like people physically moving cords to connect people. And also people sharing telephone lines called mm, party line yeah your neighbors could eavesdrop on your conversation at the time oh my goodness and watch an old movie if you've never seen a switchboard <laughs> if you are so 21st century watch an old movie maybe a shirley temple flick let me think um poor little rich girl there was a switchboard on there or an episode of the waltons and you'll you'll see people physically connecting and and talking the operator is talking with the other person on the line, seeing where they want to go. I just, I got to tell a cute little story real quick. <laughs> because our grandma, who has now passed, was born in 1926. And at, I want to say, 91, she was talking to me about calling the hospital for some reason. And she referenced the gal at the switchboard. <laughs> so in her brain... The person at the hospital picking up the lot, you know, picking up her call was the gal at the switchboard. So I just, I thought it was so cute, which is not really related to the War of the Worlds, but it's now, now the world can know our cute grandma story. <laughs> anyway. I wonder if this panic would have been in Canada at all, because she would have mm. been in Canada at this point, because our grandma didn't move to the U.S. until... It would have been a years later. It probably would have been a moot point anyway because they didn't have electricity. So, oh, that's right. Yeah, at the town that she came from at peak population, I think was four hundred some. Hmm. She was very much in the sticks. So she would have probably been totally spared. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, they might have read about it in a newspaper later, but yeah. And I wonder how far. The broadcast would have gone because I, I don't know if they would have even been broadcasting this particular program in Canada. Yeah, it's questionable. <laughs> I don't know. I could see it happening, but maybe they were all listening to the Chase and Sanborn Hour instead. <laughs> yeah, too bad we can't ask her. I would just be interested to know if she was even aware of this happening. If you now. are a 96 year old Canadian listening to this podcast, please comment below. <laughs> <laughs> in fact you'd only have to be you, you could be you could be 90 and still you know totally remember that broadcast anyway <laughs> if anybody knows whether this was broadcast in canada and whether your relatives were scared spitless let us know in the comments below or maybe if you listen to this anywhere and you were scared spitless <laughs> sure <laughs> So anyway, at that point in the story, after 40 minutes, the format of the show changes because then you're getting just the narration by the professor, Orson Welles, talking about everything he's seen from underneath this farmhouse. I love his voice. Mm -hmm. Also, he was 23. Yes. I couldn't believe that. I was really surprised. I did not know that he was that young when this happened. I, they, he smacks of genius, but maybe it's just the classy way that he talked. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, he had, a, he had a great voice. I think I think he probably actually was a genius. Either that, he was just cheeky and smart and classy enough that he came off as one. Mm -hmm. Well, at this point, it to me at least, it is extremely clear, even without the interruption reminding people that this is a play, that this is not taking place in real time. Because the way he's talking, at first it sounds like he's on the radio, but then he talks about he's writing these words down, and he doesn't know what day it is, and then he falls asleep, and then it's the next morning. And it's obvious that this is not taking sure. place as a news bulletin. 
And that's how most of the rest of the story goes. It interrupts that format to have a back and forth with the guy who in the book was the artillery man and talking about um, his plans for rebuilding society and taking down the aliens. And I mean, he's the kind of guy who would kind of be like a conspiracy theorist, except it actually happened within this story. The and artillery man? Yeah. He basically, okay. he has kind of a dim view of humanity and he wants to uh, build up this force of people who are going to take down the aliens. And he thinks that other people are going to be joining the aliens and they've got to just destroy all these evil people that he's imagined have joined the aliens, even though this hasn't actually happened. Mm. He just has all these ideas of things that aren't actually happening, even though something really big has actually happened. Mm. And I think for me, like reading the book now, the characters of the artillery man and the curate, those were what disturbed me more than the aliens, just because these... I could see people reacting in the ways of these people. How did the curate react? He kind of went crazy because I think he was like a pastor or a priest or mm -hmm. something. Well, curate probably British. Yeah. So basically at the beginning, they didn't really get along. And then he just kind of went crazier and crazier. Instead of um, remaining calm and helping the peoples, <laughs> yes, no, he was he was hiding under the farmhouse with the main with the narrator, so yeah, he wasn't helping anybody. Just the way he reacted and the way the artillerymen reacted, that was more disturbing to me than anything the aliens did. But I guess that's just because I could actually see people <laughs> becoming these fearful, conspiracy-minded individuals if something like this were to happen thinking mainly of themselves and no people really aren't like that jonathan are they really no they would be they all get, nice and helping everybody they never, and, people never get a skewed view of reality They're always out to help other people yes cough cough <laughs> but yeah that surprised me the most in rereading the story as an adult it's interesting how much that, that <laughs> more disturbed me than the aliens and i suppose the aliens don't actually show emotion no so you're not ascribing any any human qualities to them no for the most part the aliens you almost never even see them you see them a little bit when they start coming out of the ship at the beginning and i think he sees them one time in the middle and then you see them again at the end when they have died it's probably kind of like if Everybody was getting attacked by sharks. They have such cold eyes. You're not ascribing emotions to them. It's just a creepy killing thing. It could be. But I think a part of it is the fact that they've built these machines that they hide in for most of the things. So they really have no emotion because they, they're they basically a giant tank on legs. Okay. <laughs> but they have building skills. Yes. They're just inside of their writing poetry. Yeah, that's what they're doing. <laughs> but anyways, after you get through all that, um, he makes his way into the city and he finds out that the aliens have died. They've all gotten sick from Earth bacteria. And then... <laughs> that shouldn't be funny. <laughs> oh, this Earth. So germy and disease ridden. <laughs> well, you you have to think like if you actually if there is life on other planets, we're adapted to be more resistant to the bacteria on Earth. So we would never we would never have encountered bacteria that's on it, other planets. Honestly, it makes me think of native peoples dying of European diseases. Oh yeah. That's probably not what he was thinking of, but you never well, know. he could have, because we were talking about, before we recorded this, about part of his, part maybe, of his, inspiration. His thinking and his motivation. And I, I would really like it if you read that quote, if you could. Because I think it's it's very interesting for the times that he had the level of insight mm -hmm. that he did. 
I'm not saying that it's necessarily a perfect quote. No. <laughs> but but the fact that he the the wheels were actually turning. Yes. So he, there's a quote from chapter 1, The Eve of War, where he says, and before we judge them, the Martians, too harshly, we must remember what ruthless and utter destruction our own species has wrought, not only upon animals such as the vanished bison and the dodo, but upon its own inferior races. The Tasmanians, in spite of their human likeness, were entirely swept out of existence in a war of extermination waged by European immigrants in the span of 50 years. Are we such apostles of mercy as to complain if the Martians warred in the same spirit? So, he was thinking in this way. So, maybe that I... sort of was tying into the disease I... thing. I know, I read somewhere about... It was like the wheels were turning in his head of this is how the British treated this people group at this time. And I don't know that it was necessarily the Tasmanians. What if I wrote something where we were treated, the British people were treated like we treated them? Mm -hmm. And don't quote me, but I know I read something along those lines. And I thought it was, it was an interesting thought and an interesting potential motivation for the book. Mm -hmm. So, a deeper thought there than just another alien story. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there's a reason that this one, I mean, this is, I think, the, the first alien science fiction story. Really? And there's a reason that it has been so... Enduring. Yes, so enduring, so lasting, and so gone back to and copied and emulated. Mm. Yeah. There's a lot to it other than just the aliens attack and we gotta run. Sure. Another thing that should be noted is that there are accusations that the press inflated this beyond what it actually was as far as panic, but I cannot say where reality ends and the press starts. Mm hmm I think it's probably similar to what happens today when something happens somewhere and then it's all over the news. And even though these things did happen, people have an idea of it being a much bigger problem than it really was. Sure, I could see that. And as to whether it actually motivated suicides or not, I cannot say. But yeah. it definitely did motivate panic. Mm-hmm. We just don't know the scope of the panic. Yes. That's basically the end of the story. You have him, the professor, at the end kind of reflecting on the things that happened. Then Orson Welles comes out of character to tell people that this was just a Halloween. I, I don't know if he said prank or not, but basically he the said something. The equivalent of, what did he say, jumping out of a bush and saying boo. Yes. And, you know, in his <laughs> elegant way. Yes. And that it should not be taken seriously, basically. Mm -hmm. But at that point, sandwich was already done. Yeah. People came in and were destroying records of the play. Like, they were in big trouble. They were afraid that they were done for. I'm glad they didn't destroy them all because we wouldn't have it otherwise. And Wells and probably not just Wells, it was like they were interrogated for hours, wasn't weren't they? Uh I think a few people were, yeah. But the FCC, which I'm assuming is the Federal Communications Commission, mm -hmm. which regulates communications, did a three week investigation. So that's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> uh I think people were disturbed that radio could be used to such power, mm -hmm. even if it was unintended yeah. power, and it made people think. And Wells basically had to give a public apology or probably lose his career, and he appeared with facial stubble and a dewy-eyed, woe-begone look on his face and just was so innocent and apologetic and yet in his heart of hearts was rather delighted at the <laughs> huge waves that he had made unintentionally. And um, 
They got a sponsor. Campbell's Soup became the sponsor <laughs> of the show after that. It seems like such a random company. It's like, oh, <laughs> the soup company wants to sponsor the, the show that made this big panic. <laughs> and after that, his career expanded as well because mm -hmm. he was wanted for movies, but he didn't want to make a movie of War of the Worlds. He wanted to go on and do other creative projects. Yeah, I think people wanted a War of the Worlds movie from him. But he had all these other plans. And it eventually ended up in him making Citizen Kane. He was just a busy little man. <laughs> it seems so weird to think that this radio program eventually led him to make Citizen Kane. Which is a movie that I've been curious about, but it's dark enough that I'm like, ah, do I want to watch that? And then I'm also curious about The Third Man, which I kind of want to watch, which is based off of, oh, it might be post World, either during or post World War II in Vienna. And yeah. One of the people that I think had been fooled by him said that he was a carbuncle on the rump of degenerate theatrical performers. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought that was so funny. <laughs> but other people loved him. There were people who were very upset that they had been fooled, other people were just relieved. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ladies, she and I think a friend of hers went into a bar saying that the world was going to end and they ended up just drinking and having a good time and, and she wrote him a letter saying that he owed her for however many scotch highballs or whatever <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and she just took everything with a laugh and it's like, it's a very interesting example of how people would react to mm -hmm. the end of the world and the end of their lives where... Some people are just going to be totally scared, and other people are like, okay, we're going to make this. Make the I most mean, of there it. was one lady where there's like, well, we might as well eat this chicken because we're not going to be alive. <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> what it, What's with the eating of the chicken? If you're going to be dead anyway, I guess, are you trying to have this last little bit of pleasure? Your last pleasure is chicken. Either that you just don't want your leftovers molding in the refrigerator. You, maybe the aliens will eat it for you. Like, what? Is, what is this with the chicken? Anyway. And then there was one person that was absolutely horrible. Speaking of disturbing people who just felt that people who fell for this as a hoax should be sterilized. And... I am disturbed by anybody who wants to sterilize anybody else. Like, that. don't think that way about people. It is not your job. That This is, that's a, that's a Hitler thing. Mm. Don't, don't think that you have a right to maim and control anybody that you think is inferior to you because then you're falling into little, little dictator mode. And one can only hope that you never get a large amount of power. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's another little happy thought for this <laughs> for this podcast. And go check out Nelson Eddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's all we have for the 1938 War of the Worlds radio play. A very different kind of episode, but. I thought it was interesting. I thought it would make for a great discussion, and I think it did. I think that this is an episode that, if you're interested in 1930s history, World War II history, the history great of War of the Worlds, Orson Welles, Great Depression, radio history. Yes, like this. This is a podcast that if you have history nerds in your life, they could take stuff away from. If somebody's into vintage music. They might find, yeah, they might they might find that interesting. I don't know. I don't know. But if you have a history lover or a vintage lover in your life, this might be a good podcast for, for you two to listen to as you're driving down the road seeking out adventure in this strange world of ours. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's all for this episode. We will see you in the future for another one. All right. Bye. Bye.
Thank you so much for listening to the first episode on our series on the War of the Worlds, and thank you to Sarah for joining me, even though this kind of story really isn't her favorite. Next time I'm going to be joined by a brand new guest to the show, one of my fellow writers for the Rotoscopers, A.J. Howell, will be joining me, and we're going to be talking about the original film version of the story from 1953. Now, despite me being a fan of this story, I've never actually watched the original film, so I'm really excited to jump into this one. So we'll see you next time on Every Version Ever. Thanks for listening. Later, when their bodies were examined in laboratories, it was found that they were killed by the putrefactive and disease bacteria against which their systems were unprepared. Slain, after all, man's defenses had failed by the humblest thing that God, as wisdom, has put upon this earth.